let me start re-recording. Perfect. Uh, all right. Thanks a lot, uh, Avik. This was uh, this was a great talk, and uh, now I'm very happy that uh, we have in our uh, as as our next speaker, uh, Maurice Fallon, um, who is a Royal Society Research Fellow at the University Robotics at the Oxford Robotics Institute at the University of Oxford. Um, he holds a PhD in Information Engineering from University of Cambridge. Uh, from 2008 to 2012, he was a postdoc in the Marine Robotics Group working on robot, robotic navigation. From 2012 to 2015, he was the perception lead of MIT's team in the DRC, developing autonomy state estimation and planning for the Boston Dynamics Atlas robot. And his research is focused on probabilistic methods for localization and mapping and state estimation for like robots. And he's also interested in dynamic motion planning and control. And today he's gonna talk to us about navig the navigation systems uh, for industrial inspection with uh, quadruped uh, robots. Uh, thanks a lot, Maurice, uh, the stage is yours. Okay, um, can you see my screen and uh, hear me okay? Yes, it's perfect. Hopefully the videos are gonna work also. We'll see, I will let you know if something is not, <laughs> it's not functioning. Okay. Okay, thanks everybody and thanks for joining us. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to, to join this uh, lineup of people speaking in the workshop and it's uh, really nice to follow Avik's talk which is um, complementary with and maybe slightly disjoint from the work that we work on. So I um, lead a, a pretty new group um, in um, Oxford called the Dynamic Robot Systems Group and we've grown quite quickly. Um, it's kind of a joint group that I, I'm running with uh, Dr. Yanis Savutis who have indicated there with a circle um, and we're kind of half and half focusing on perception and navigation problems on one side and then motion planning and control on the other side. Um, about 90% of our work so far has been on the animal. Um, we have a, a copy of the, the ghost vision that you can see on the right hand side, but we haven't been able to do very much with it due to the lockdown. And my background, as, as Dimitri said, was is uh, originally in perception. So you can see here some previous work on on large scale mapping and LIDAR mapping. And I got involved in, um, in dynamic sensing. So sensors that are moving aggressively where things like motion blur and the speed of motion are, are important. And eventually that led into being involved in the dark robo robotics challenge, um, uh, working with uh, uh, Russ Tedrick, Scott Kindersma, and uh, some of the people that Scott mentioned in his talk last week, uh, developing uh, manipulation, locomotion, footstep planning, and in particular in my part, uh, state estimation for the Atlas to carry out all of these tasks you can see in the video. Um, one of the things from that period that I was, uh, that, uh, was most sort of, uh, um, I was most proud of at that time was real-time uh, perception and segmentation for, for contact planning. And it's a few years ago, but I think this is really kind of the, the crux of what, what, what I'm interested in is being able to put um, high, high speed, or well, I mean, in, in this case, Atlas was moving, wasn't doing forward flips like it is now, but putting real-time perception and decision-making together um, to allow the robot to do things while in motion. So obviously switching to something a little bit more sustainable uh, and a little bit more impact resilient, we've, we've shifted, I've shifted my focus to quadrupeds. We have a, a copy of the animal robot in, in, in our group and uh, I split my talk into three sections talking about planning and control, uh, kind of mission or autonomy, and then perception and navigation at the end. Uh, and uh, the first topic I'll talk about is work we've done to improve a, an open source project called uh, Trajectory Optimization for Walking Robots, or Tower, is more likely known, uh, developed by Alex Winkler, which um, is a minimal enough uh, trajectory optimization package that, uh, that uh, formulates motions as a function of an initial and start an end state simple body, um, single body uh, dynamics, and uh, some constraints on our uh, on um, expressing forces through pyramid, our friction cones, and uh, formulates that as a trajectory optimization problem um, subject to polynomials which describe the trajectory of the robot, the feet positions, and the forces transcribed and then solved using IP opt to give you something like this, where you see trajectories of each of the variables over time described by um, polynomials discretized with a, a few uh, hundred milliseconds. Um, and that was th that creates some very interesting results from um, Alex's original paper. Um, 
and when the solver is able to complete the feasibility, um, but that, that gives you some, some um, uh, information to say that the action um, is acceptable to the, the framing of the problem, but not necessarily that it's, that it's, it's viable. So in, if you look closely in some of these videos between knot points, for example, the feet don't necessarily uh, pass over obstacles and it's not necessarily fully plausible. So what we wanted to do is to use this as a, a base motion generator. And what we've been doing is working on applying additional costs and constraints to these trajectory optimization problems so that they can be reliably executed on a whole body controller. And this is work that we're, we've presented here at ICRA. And you know, there's no free lunch. So obviously that, that adding this extra, these extra costs and computation terms increases uh, computation time. And we've also been looking at using uh, warm starting or um, uh, initial guesses from uh, a learned neural network to, to speed up that optimization to try and get back to um, a kind of re, um, iterative replanning strategy. So here's an illustration of some of the original trajectories. You can see that uh, the body tends to roll a lot, not necessarily um, placing uh, the feet in, in reliable or stable positions. By the incorporation of, of some constraints, uh, or sorry, additional cost terms, you can see that the, the, bot, the motions are much more uh, physically real, realizable, and these could be then executed on the, on the animal robot. Um, however, you pay the price of, of the increased cost, additional optimization variables, as I mentioned. So what you see here in this particular video is we're then using um, these additional costs um, and harvesting successful trajectories in using physics simulator, Xebo in this case, and using those to, uh, to cluster and to um, create a learning mechanism so, such that uh, with high degree of confidence, high degree of success rate, when physically evaluated in the, in, in the gazebo simulator and uh, reducing the, the um, cost of, of the full set of constraints, we've ne we're now able to propose um, trajectories which have um, variance in the initial, and initial starting conditions. Uh, for example, uh, we can place the robot down in approximately the same location and then um, execute uh, trajectories using these initializations. So the key point is uh, we're able to generate some of these dynamic trajectories. Here, here are some flat ground, um, uh, which have been effectively computed within a second or two by initializing based off of computation that's been done offline. So these are trots on, on flat ground, uh, but also on uneven terrain. So you can see here um, dynamically climbing staircases in which the ratio of the execution time or the computation time to execution time is favorable. Um, and you can see here, this is probably the, the most dynamic maneuver. So two seconds of, of computation time, 10 iterations of the IP opt underlying solver being used. Um, what we're doing, and this is, this is ICRA work, and now we're, we're trying to move past that in our latest work. We're, um, we, want, we want to obviously move towards a kind of a replanning strategy. What, what you saw there was effectively um, open loop trajectories being executed with an underlying stabilization using a whole body controller um, from um, Dario Bellascoli uh, from his uh, Bellicoso uh, from his uh, PhD in, in Marco Hooter's group. And that, so effectively we're streaming these trajectories to the robot and it's pretty impressive that just with this whole body controller as a kind of intermediate filter that, that these long sequences can be successfully executed. But what we want to do is to be able to replan these trajectories um, in an iterative fashion use, and then use, use kind of rolling out MPC to execute them. So this is a kind of visualization of what that would look like. Um, the yellow box corresponds to the computation time to plan the next dark blue, um, or well, the, the next dark blue motion and, 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 and what follows it. Um, and here are some, some plan illustrations. So this is iteratively solving ahead for a couple of seconds um, and then executing the, the nearest part and then uh, repeating that process to try to go to the carrot that you can see. And in particular, in the, in the top case, you can see that by using this learned initialization, uh, we can then uh, do things like avoid obstacles uh, with, with this trajectory optimization backend. Um, and here you can see uh, control stabilized, our, our first kind of work on, on achieving control stabilization with this, so, so it kind of, the, the, the gray background is the, is the, is the, the plan and the dark, the, the fully colored animal is, is the control stabilized in, in gazebo. 
Um, the next topic I'm going to talk about is a little bit outside my area, but it's um, it's work from Sid Gangaparwala, who's a PhD student with with, with uh, Yanis. Um, and we would have seen some work on reinforcement learning, for example, uh, making great progress uh, to do complicated tasks. But uh, reinforcement learning, especially on, on physical systems like this, of a poor sample efficiency. Um, it's also also requires kind of hyperparameter tuning. And, it's, and with a physical system that's doing something that you'd like to be able to certify some level of performance, it's difficult to have any kind of guarantee that um, locomotion uh, will behave uh, uh, predictably if it, if it fall outside of the sample set that, that is used to train the, the RL agent. Uh, what SID is focusing on is being able to, to use what's called guided constraint policy optimization. So effectively using uh, constraints and costs as well as a kind of an expert um, expert demonstration sample set to uh, to guide the, to guide the planner. So we're, this is a problem in which we're, 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 the input is a velocity command, and we want to come up with a reinforcement learning policy to be able to achieve it. And and what we're trying to do is to in, increase the sample efficiency. Uh, what 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 you're probably familiar with is that for unconstrained learning, there's very poor sample efficiency, and you need to have many samples to be able to achieve even basic uh, mobility of any, any variety. But for this, these two examples, left and right, um, the one on the right is, is not necessarily good walking, but by just by providing some costs to encourage the learning to have a periodic motion, uh, these two uh, procedures, which have had the same number of learning samples, um, the one on the right is able to learn more quickly. So by incorporation of more comprehensive set of, con of, of cost functions and reward terms, for example, encouraging the feet to stay stationary, encouraging uh, the feet to remain within um, reasonable positions relative to the robot, um, smoothness in the, in, in the joint trajectory, um, that, that the feet should only, only, only push when in contact and, and shouldn't have any force when, when they're not in contact. Uh, we can accelerate and increase the sample efficiency of, of learning. So this is, can allow the learning algorithm to produce a walking trajectory that's um, that's um, uh, usable on the robot uh, with much fewer samples, so maybe an order of magnitude less than than, than pure um, um, uh, pure learning based approach. Uh, and this is this couples both um, expert examples from um, in this case the whole body um, trotting controller that comes with the animal, um, harvesting those demonstrations, and also pairing that with the constraints that I mentioned uh, to kind of switch blend between. Um, the whole body controller inputs, then moving over to the, the cost-based approach to fine-tune the, 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 the approach. Um, and it's pretty impressive results, pretty, pretty impressive robustness to things like, you can see here, the, the feet are catching, um, the algorithm was developed, um, developed and tested in the lab, and then uh, we have some nice demonstrations both here, walking on uneven terrain, well, maybe not the most uneven terrain, but here working where there's quite significant disturbances, uh, where Sid is manipulating it, and the ground is very slip, slippery. Um, and the next thing that Sid is working on is to move towards being able to give this approach the um, the sense of sense of vision, so so that it's it, we're responding to um, to visual impulse to to to, to be more um, deliberative. <clears throat> so the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, mission and motion plannings. These are kind of more uh, applications driven. One of the things that uh, that we've been doing is try to develop autonomy to allow the robot to do things like uh, go from point A to point B in a multi-floor uh, scenario such as this test facility that we commonly use in uh, near Oxford. So it's a three-floor facility and if you wanted to map that and start to plan out a, a mission then you have this giant point cloud maybe made from a, a scanner or a handheld system um, how can you sort of create structure on that so that you can do missions? So our approach is to, um, to break down uh, the environment by um, uh, interpreting the terrain that's walkable. So this is in red is indicated the terrain that's smooth and walkable. And then to move on from there to uh, define the most smooth terrain, which, which, which we can use, for example, blind or high speed trotting or in red would be terrain which is, is more rough, or for example, that also includes staircase climbing, and to switch between different meta controllers to be able to execute these, um, execute point-to-point -to -point navigation 
and also to be able to optimally plan to get from A to B. Um, and what, what this work called Gate Mesh does from our team uh, is it dramatically reduces the, uh, the size of this point cloud down to a much more minimal triangulated mesh. And on that mesh, we can do uh, motion planning in, in a small number of seconds. What I found interesting looking at one of the unboxing videos from, from the spot, uh, the Boston Dynamic Spot, was that even for staircase climbing of spot, you have to do this meta selection of choosing between flat ground walking controller and a stairs controller, also choose, choosing velocities. And effectively, this is what, um, what this work tries to do automatically by just an anal analyzing this prior map. Here's an illustration of, um, of um, an industrial demonstration. So this was an industrial test facility. Um, the, the task was for the robot to go from point to this red marker. Initially, the, um, the path is unblocked and the robot's trotting away. It's, it's, it's maybe at 0.4 meters per second. Um, and then at a certain point, uh, uh, using its real-time perception that that pathway is blocked, um, the robot's able to add a virtual object into the, the path planner and immediately able to uh, replan within a, within a couple of milliseconds a new plan, which goes in a different route, uh, an original route, which was shorter, but um, has this uh, locomotion obstacle, and then we're switching between um, these controller algorithms to, uh, to choose the appropriate one for the terrain before finishing the mission with a trotting controller. Another application is looking at um, active active mapping. So we wanted to look at using the robot to, uh, to do inspections of, of facilities. So for example, uh, this, uh, this industrial object here, well, it's surrounded by obstacles. So for example, a stairwell, um, a rough edge, and, and a complete drop off behind the robot. Um, and what we've been looking at is uh, building up 3D models of the environment uh, with uh, the LiDAR scans. Um, converting the object of interest to an to an, an, an octo map, and then planning on a lighter based reconstruction of the vicinity of the robot, um, and then using that to iteratively plan to carry out this this inspection mission. So here you can see uh, using uh, kinematic planning plan, or kinematic planner or RT to to plan the next route, and then iteratively uh, doing planning, which is taking advantage of both the mobility of a, of a legged system, but also doing things that are doing analysis of the, of the local terrain up to maybe five, six, seven meters of the, ahead of the robot to avoid safety obstacles. We've also extended this work towards um, radiation inspection. Um, the UK um, nuclear industry is interested in using legged robots to do uh, radiation inspection. Um, there are a lot of uh, buildings, for example, in Sellafield, which is one of the, the, the largest um, worldwide facilities for uh, storage of nuclear fuel, which have been inaccessible for a long period of time because there are no uh, robotic systems that have the right characteristics for doing radiation inspections, as you can see on the right-hand side. And we've been working with a company called Createc to uh, take their handheld radiation sensor that you see in the bottom left to modularize that and to install it on the Anima. It's, a, it's basically a gamma radiation sensor that's surrounded by a, um, a, um, a big chunk of tungsten so as to make, make it directional so it can only see radiation that's coming from a certain direction. And we've been working towards doing these kind of um, industrial inspections. Uh, this is one in a, in a, in a, in a low-grade radiation so, uh, facility in which the robot's supposed to do iterative uh, inspections uh, of these barrels which contain low-grade radiation. And uh, this is what the, the kind of radiation maps look like, the, um, um, uh, hot spots within 3D, 3D occupancy maps or 3D point clouds. Um, the radiation in this particular, um, it's interesting to do legged like, robotic experiments with active radiation sources. So uh, at the moment, we've, we've only got as far as, as controlled sources or controlled environments. Uh, so the radiation samples on the end of this tripod, uh, this tri uh, tripod and um, effectively by iteratively scanning in the environment, the animal is able to localize the presence of the radiation and color it in the map. Um, so moving on to the last topic uh, that I'm gonna talk about today is on the more perception and navigation side, my, my, my kind of primary background. Um, state estimation is a big challenge. So you can do a lot of awesome stuff on, on flat ground as Avik has shown. Um, with minimal state estimation, because if you've a good IMU, you're able to um, get an orientation estimate, you're able to get a signal of velocity off the off uh, your stable contacts that are in, in contact with the ground. 
but things get a little bit more challenging when you want to do deliberative things that are going up uh, uneven terrain, uh, crossing steps, for example. And this, this typically results in the robot having to slow down because um, legged state estimation uh, suffers from a lot of problems with um, and, 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 and a lot of problems with um, with the deformations or nonlinearities in, in the contact. So you have to decide which feet are in contact. Um, even though they're striking the ground, it's very difficult to classify those. And what you typically see is that you have to slow the robot down to be able to um, to have a sufficiently accurate state estimate. Now that, that's great work from from um, Peter Fankhauser, who was in RSL at the time. Uh, but we'd like to be able to have the robot moving dynamically. And what I feel is necessary to do is to take this legged state estimation, which um, uh, we've worked on for quite some time. There's an open source package with a um, um, with a kinematic um, uh, sort of legged state estimation package that, that we've jointly developed with Marco Huter or Marco uh, Kamore, one of the researchers in my lab, uh, for the last number of years. Um, or, for example, the, the TSIF, which is the core state estimator on the on the animal, gives you a kind of reliable and low drift state estimator for the robot, but it, it suffers from the fact that um, that to just continual drift depending on how fast you're moving and the terrain you're moving on and what we've been working towards is putting a lot of effort into visual inertial odometry uh, so it's a pretty stable field but bringing them together onto the onto the legged robot is one of the one of the challenges how to get the best of both worlds so you get accurate incremental estimation with the vision system but low latency that you need to have for for controls and um, so this work VLANs, which which again we presented here at ICRA uh, tightly fuses the vision and the IMU uh, with leg kinematics. And we've been working primarily with uh, consumer grade cameras such as the Intel RealSense D435i. Um, why? Because th these models are scattered across the, the bodies of most of the uh, commercialized uh, platforms at this stage. And what we're doing is effectively shifting away from a legged odometry focus system that sometimes has vision within it to a very much vision syst focus system that kind of optionally incorporates leg odometry. So it might, in theory, be able to support um, motion estimation, not, not in theory, but in, in actuality, support motion estimation when the robot's stumbling or being pushed or hopefully in the future uh, having a flight phase. Um, so typically we have, a, have a, uh, the typical elements of, of a state vector, so orientation and position of the floating base, it's linear velocities and biases. Um, this is all quite similar to what you'd have in a, a visual inertial system. Uh, you'd be maintaining estimates of the biases of the gyro and the accelerometer. Uh, but to that, we also add this, um, these kind of slack variables for linear velocity and angular velocity uh, of the leg legged system. Um, we, incorporate, we solve all of the, these constraints using windowed uh, least squares optimization. Um, so the constraints for uh, the initial priors of the, of the system the IMU uh, uh, information. So this is integrating the IMU down from 400 hertz to approximately 15 or 20 hertz. Um, vision prior, so that's um, uh, observations of the environment. And finally, the, the kinematic com contributions. These are sp things specific to legged robotics. So we have a twist vector. So this is uh, integrating the, the, the incremental velocity of the robot down from 400 hertz down to about 20 hertz. And additionally, the, the biases, which is one of the items that we thought a lot about how we were uh, representing that. And this is all a least squares optimization problem that's solved typically using GTSAM. Now, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about this, uh, this concept of pre-integrated kinematic uh, term. Uh, the robots typically uh, uh, have minimal flexibility within their system. What we're trying to do is to infer velocity based off of joints that are continuously going into contact and coming out of contact, which cause, causes spurious and um, estimated velocity measurements from the, from the leg kinematics. And um, there's also you know, different terrain materials, mud, there might be compliance in the foot, compliance in different parts of the foot, depending on whether it's the tip of the toe or the side of the, side of the toe. Um, and what we found is that by introducing this extra, extra biasing term, uh, we can, uh, reduce our dr the drift rate of the odometry by effectively pushing down a lot of these very difficult to model effects down into the um, down into uh, a, an additional term which is, is in, uh, which is slowly varying um, and then this is also the mechanism that we use to reduce the the high level frequency of maybe a 400 hertz state estimator 
down to 20 hertz for the least squares optimization. Um, uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate some results of, that show the, the, how this works and what's going on under the hood. So you can see on the bottom left visual feature tracking and uh, you'll see stable, um, reliable, long visual feature tracks. They're, they're, they're the key thing to be able to achieve uh, low drift, high frequency estimation. Um, you can see the yellow dots which correspond to the visual features in the real world. Um, and despite the fact that the robot's being pushed around, the robot's climbing up staircases or climbing up uh, a slope here. Um, uh, it's walking in long grass. The, um, the, the drift rate is very small relative to the ground truth that you're getting here from an external tracking system. So we put a lot of investment into being able to measure drift rate. Uh, you can see it here again in this particular um, longer experiment on uh, primarily on flat ground. Um, over maybe two or, uh, two or 300 meters, uh, we only have a few meters of drift in this kind of uh, scenario. Um, and the, one of the key uses is actually going back to the, the local environment with uh, just an odometry based uh, onboard sensor, a pre perceptive based uh, state estimation. Uh, if you're building these terrain maps to do things like perceptive control, this is work that we've um, been, uh, been trying to do with uh, the RSL group in, in Zurich. Um, your, your elevation maps will be uh, will contain these spurious edges and that, that will make it very difficult for the controller to know what to do if this is spurious and non-flat um, object exists uh, that, that doesn't exist in reality. Um, with our approach, um, fusing the vision online, you can also do some of these things with LiDAR, but with vision, uh, you have the capacity to incorporate the sensors deeply within the robot, not necessarily have a LiDAR on the top of the robot and possibly also to be able to achieve higher frequency and lower latency. Um, we've been able to, to, to construct elevation maps and then feed them to the perception controller that are, um, uh, that are more consistent with what's going on in the environment despite the dynamic motion. And the last topic I'll talk about is LiDAR mapping. So um, to be able to navigate around the environment, it's important to be able to build a representation that has a long, long range. So typically using LiDAR for that. Um, we've developed a LiDAR-based SLAM system uh, running on the Animal and um, ICP odometry, quite similar to some of the systems that are being run in the subterranean challenge. Um, and we have a pose graph at the back of it, and we're detecting loop closures, both with a learned algorithm from one of, uh, one of my students, uh, Georgie, and then uh, um, optimizing the graph. Um, this is an illustration of the algorithm running real time on the robot. The SLAM system from above here is creating these accurate 3D maps. And then we're just having the robot follow back to the starting point, just homing back to the origin uh, and autonomously coming back to the starting point. Uh, we try to modularize this. Uh, so we have a single unit that could be, you could install, you could buy and install on, on, on a robot or uh, make it up very quickly such that um, we can, can, can test and verify our, uh, our mapping and navigation systems without needing a legged robot. So this is a handheld system mapping a large scale facility large scale co college that's about a kilometer by a kilometer and um, doing so simply by walking around. So this is a, uh, a large data set that you might be interested in using in, in maybe your own navigation algorithm development. And um, it's ouster and real sense um, all in a single sort of dynamically moving sensor payload with some ground truth. Um, and we've taken that payload package and, and also started to reuse it on our other platforms. Um, unfortunately, it's the only results I can show from the uh, from the ghost robot. This is the very last experiment that we we did before the, the shutdown of our lab in March for COVID, um, and we've just taken this modular sensor payload, installed it on the robots, and you can see here accurate reconstructions um, that we can use for for mission mission tasks such as exploration or the radiation mapping that I mentioned previously. And uh, I don't have time to go into one of the other collaborative projects we have. It's an EU project called uh, called Thing. We've been working with both RSL and um, and the the Legged Robotics Group in, in Poznan um, on um, on these two topics. One is uh, I call it scratching in the deep, maybe Marco, rather than what Marco Marco Huder was calling it, but uh, effectively probing concrete in sewers to determine the level of degradation of the um, facility, and also using the sense of touch to um, localize a robot so you can use the idea that the robot is, is blind, but it can use each one of the contact events it has to be able to localize on a terrain map, or in this case, um, against um, a series of obstacles to, to, to precisely position the end effector. 
Um, the, last, the last thing I'll just say is a few observations on um, uh, where legged like, robotics are going. I'm, I guess I, we're, we're, we're not a robot builder, we're, we're observing it, but we're seeing, you know, obviously in the last two years, we're seeing significant improvements in, in the packaging and the completeness of robots uh, that, are, that are available. There are now uh, certainly stable companies that are producing product cycles, um, as Avik mentioned. Um, but like Go and, and Ghost and obviously uh, Antibiotics who, who we've been working with. So there's, I think there's a shift in, in legged like robotics research that might be similar to what was going on with say, jet engines or microprocessors in the past. Uh, and there, there's a question about what role universities play when there are professional development teams moving just as fast as what we're doing in research. Um, I would reiterate and say that perceptual locomotion on uneven terrain is a key challenge and a key selling point we can continuously hear from companies who are interested in, in working with us uh, on, on, on demonstrators. Um, and there is quite a challenge to meet the, their, their expectations, particularly in safety critical scenarios like in energy companies, uh, things like ATEX certification. Um, I've probably run over, so maybe we can come back to that, a talk about which legged robot and what are the things that I th we've thought about when, when choosing it. I would mention that one of the reasons why, why we've been so made such good progress with the animal is because we've had access to an open research community, the animal research community. Uh, so I've mentioned quite a few times that we've been using things like uh, Dario Belascoso's um, uh, um, whole body controller as an interface for executing of our, our motions. And that's uh, really thanks in large part to the, the animal research community, which is supported by Antibiotics and also by RSL. Okay, um, I'll finish with that and maybe it'll start to take questions. Uh, Marco, are you still there? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Maurice. Uh, you can, if, if you could uh, stop sharing the screen, it would be great. Perfect. All right. So we we have a few questions, mostly from me and uh, Marco, though. But uh, uh, I will start with um, a question about. So we'll go through your topics. I guess uh, this is uh, how the questions were asked. So for 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 the beginning, for the tower uh, optimization. Uh, Marco asked if uh, the, so the, the the trajectory optimization is not replanning while executing. How do you envision to deal with uncertainty coming from the environment or uh, state estimation? Um, so the, well, the first thing that I, I kind of mentioned maybe after you asked the question was that uh, we're, what impressed us was that uh, these five six second trajectories that we were planning, which are probably longer than we'll, we'll, we'll use going forward, could be executed open loop. Uh, not, they're not open loop in the sense of um, of uh, being passed directly to the motors, but they're going to the whole body controller. So it's the stabilizing effect of the whole body controller uh, is really doing a lot to, to make sure the robot's able to execute the trajectories. Um, uh, so I, so it kind of acts as a filter that that allows us to to pass through trajectories um, without having to worry about things with uh, deviations away from 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 nominal. Uh, on short time scales. So obviously for moving on to longer times time scales or continuously replanning, then we have to be able to use the perceptual input uh, to, uh, to uh, replan. Um, and another key aspect is that the state estimator is only drifting in the order of a couple of centimeters for those motions. So you, you, for the types of motions that I illustrated there, we could get away with ignoring state estimation on those time scales. It's probably on the very upper end of the scales in which you could just ignore state estimation drift. All right. Okay. On, on the learning part, um, a question from uh, Mo Yin is uh, how close are the learned initializations by the neural network to the successfully converged solution in the optimization problem? Do they have any viability in being run on the real robot directly? They do. They do. Um, one of my videos, uh, maybe I included it, maybe I excluded it, did actually have a, a trajectory that was executed directly um, from the learned solution. So what, what the learned solution gives us, it gives us the capacity to have the robot within you know, plus or minus five centimeters, plus or minus a certain degree or a certain orientation, and to be able to, pick, to effectively pick from a, a large set of samples that are stored in the network. Um, but if we get very, if we choose, if we have a sample that's very similar to the starting and end conditions, then we can use it directly. Um, we're not specifically choosing it directly, but it, but it is, it is plausible because of the kind of fat in the, or the slack in the, in the whole body controller execution, 
to take a trajectory that's quite similar to the uh, to the plan that you want to execute and actually just execute it straight away. So um, the we, we envisage that the offline trajectory optimization database that we're creating will actually take up quite a lot of the um, uh, do a lot of the, the lifting for for the work going forward. All right. Okay. One question from my side uh, regarding the reinforcement learning. Um, I'm basically uh, to understand a little bit how easy or difficult it is. So how, how much data do you need to produce the, the walking trajectories and could you avoid somehow handcrafted reward functions uh, in this direction? So, uh, so, so firstly, the, the, one of the key points of that work was that we were able to reduce the, by an order of magnitude the number of samples. So I, the, number, the numbers I, I have at hand are more like uh, hundreds of millions of, of, of samples rather than billions of samples from the really good work from, uh, from Jim and Wangbo that came before that. Uh, and obviously, the, I didn't mention it verbally, but the, uh, the actuator network was taken from his work as well. And that's kind of an essential kind of, not necessarily hand-tuned, but uh, robot-specific components. Um, to give the network this uh, periodic capacity, um, that kind of is a, is a key thing that needs to learn to be able to start refining uh, locomotion strategies. Uh, uh, um, that's, that's, it doesn't need to come necessarily from a, a very well created whole body controller. We had access to this whole body controller from, from RSL, but um, uh, according to Sid, the, the, uh, the having a network that, that prying, prying the network with, priming the network with a periodic motion is, is kind of the key thing to allow there to be more efficient learning. All right, uh, moving to the inspection. Um, again, from my side, uh, what do you think are the challenges of inspection versus other applications on legged robots? Uh, do, you, do you see something in particular that is challenging in this particular use case versus other use cases? Um, I think it's, well, I don't necessarily think there's something majorly challenging, but I think it's, it, from, from what I can see, except for military applications for like go to a point, uh, inspection of expensive facilities are what I think are the most obvious commercialization opportunities for quadrupeds. So we, uh, we've had some applied funding from the UK and they all come back to kind of inspection kind of applications. And what, um, I think that they put quite high bars on, you can't just say this staircase is too steep. Um, you can't just say that this, uh, this terrain is too rough. It, it, you're, um, they, you're, you're put up against uh, wheeled systems and you really have to be able to do what they can do and they can do and do more uh, to be able to be a viable alternative. I think uh, some companies are interested in using um, quadrupeds, uh, but they're still, you know, they're still suspicious of, of that controller malfunction that causes the robot to crash to the ground kind of thing. Um, so we, reliability is, is really important to be able to, uh, to convince companies, I think. All right. Uh on this topic, do you take any advantage of the inspected site morphology of how it looks for better results rather than, um, you know, working on general planning, general path, uh, path planning, etc. cetera? Uh, is, is there something that, you know, the fact that there are walls, the fact that there are, you know, pipes or, or this kind of thing? Um, well, I mean, I think the most basic, the, the most basic uh, inspections that we've done are pretty, uh, hand labeled, you know, you're, you're hand labeling X, Y coordinates for the robot to go to and right. locations of where objects are that you want to do ins inspection of. Um, and I think that's, that's quite similar to what I've seen Boston Dynamics and Antibiotics uh, talking about, um, you know, a teach phase where you point out where you want, want the robot to look at or um, where you want it to stop to, to create a measurement. Uh, certainly not at the case where robots can just do autonomous inspection by themselves. It has to be entirely goal driven, and those goals come from a human being. And it has to be repeatable as well, uh, and, and, and there has to be no surprises. So um, I think, um, uh, especially energy companies, they're not interested in robots that are going to be you know, making unexpected decisions by themselves. All right. Uh, from a question from uh, B. Barkov. Uh, do the is is the leg robot uh, does the leg robot use any behavior gate template libraries? I'm not quite sure what that means, but the like 
the, the work from our, our own group on controls uh, wasn't really using any any gay template libraries, but the kind of stock controllers from antibiotics, the trot controller, that's a periodic, uh, a traditional periodic trot controller um, with, with a gay template. All right. Um... Uh, from a question from uh, Ming Sung An, the vision data seem to be very clean. Are you doing any any kind of pre uh, uh, pre processing or or something? I, I assume it's on the visual tracking. Um, uh, well, I mean, we what we do we we will be doing things like image equalization, so uh, uh, balancing the contrast across the image. That that does that is essential to be able to to. Uh, to deal with you know lighting variation when you come um, from very bright to very dark areas, maybe that's what, what you're talking about. So there is quite a lot of pre-processing, but it, it, uh, on on the front end to do that, um, quite quite typical methods that you'll find in op other open source packages. All right, uh, and then uh, from the same person, uh, another question: uh, from the given map, you identify places where you could locomote. How was this uh, decided? Okay, I think that's the uh, gate mesh work that I talked about. And so we had a large point cloud and effectively we're doing um, uh, local, local normal estimation to determine where the smooth normals are, where the flattest parts are. So we have a high resolution LiDAR map analyzing which parts of the map are smooth and then um, on those LiDAR points determine are allocating the, the walk behavior, whether it's walking or trotting, high speed walking. Um, and then to speed up the, 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 look, the, the, the motion planning, we're doing triangulation uh, to, uh, to reduce the, the size of, of, of the map so that we can do very efficient point-to-point -point mapping. I hope that answers that question. All right, all right. A uh, couple of questions from our side as well. Um, so we, we have seen very dynamic motions from, uh, from Boston Dynamics uh, on Atlas. Uh, and uh, I, I was wondering if you think that they have solved somehow the state estimation problem. I mean, um, they seem to do a very good job in estimating the, the center of mass trajectory, et cetera, while they're jumping from box yeah, to box. It's, it's while, while they're jumping is the interesting bit. Uh, I, in particular, there was one, one portion from Scott's video where uh, they were pulling the robot from behind. Exactly. In so this is like when it's jumping, they, they, they pull it. And it's yeah. very interesting. Like. Do you think they have uh, developed some some techniques that they could really track the center of mass uh, trajectory on the on the robots? Yeah, I mean, uh, for a lot of the work and the, the work that I had uh, when I was working with Atlas was, wasn't using any um, dynamic model, so it was kind of a ballistic model state estimator, um, you know, integrated in the IMU. So I, I think that the piece of information we're not using is the dynamics of the system. Um, and so a comparison between how it is motion, moving and how uh, you physically expect it to move given the, 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 both the accelerations from, from, the, from the IMU and also the, the force sensing. Um, I think that certain, certain things like uh, small jumps, like jumping up onto a pallet or jumping up onto a block, they're, they're not so complicated to do because your, your flight phase is, is smooth and continuous but the the kind of the, the in particular I, I i saw the one that was pulling with a rope and that was quite interesting to see what was going on under the hood um, all right all right last question from marco uh, what is coming after uh, quadrupeds uh, what are your thoughts uh, regarding bipeds uh well like bipeds in, in the uk or, or bipeds in my lab or or, 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 or. <laughs> i don't know you can <laughs> you can start yeah. with uh, your lab and then go uh, with uh, marco I think my thought was more like regarding your last slides where you showed, uh, okay, the quadrupeds are converging and we have more and more yeah. companies out there selling them. Yeah. Um, what do you think is at some point bipeds coming and replacing all the quadrupeds? Well, I, I don't know. I, I think like there's, there's, there's with the, with the, 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 the faculty hat on or the professors hat on where, uh, you know, you have to, you have to be able to write grant proposals that have a commercial use case and, uh, I think that it's very hard to write a grant proposal that proposes to start a biped, uh, uh, or sorry, a humanoid research group um, uh, because of uh, applications. So I think that it, if you look closely at, at companies that are trying to commercialize bipeds, I'm, it's quite difficult to come up with use cases for them. I think that Agility have done a really good job and they're, I really like the platform. It's really minimal and, and 
Uh, I think they'll, they'll do very well selling it to universities, but I, I, I don't know if there's a, if, if from what I, from what my experience with DARPA Robotics Challenge, it just takes an army. It takes five guys working on, on controls, like locomotion and uh, state estimation, and another five guys working on, uh, on manipulation to be able to do anything. And then you've got so many other challenges. So it's, it, humanoids, is, humanoids is challenging. Quadrupeds is a bit more manageable, I think. Put wheels on them, I suppose, Marco, is the solution. Well, <laughs> yes, that would be my answer. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, 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 sorry, on this topic, we have an extra question. Do you think delivery is a, is a viable use case for uh, quadrupeds? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, we, we have talked to a company about, about that. They, there, it depends on how forward thinking, thinking the company is. I mean, it's certainly a bottleneck uh, for delivery. Um, uh, I, think, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's viable. I think that with inspection on, on, ex, on expensive facilities, you've got um, you've got the right combination of uh, of it's dangerous for people, it's expensive for people, so you've got a margin for companies to do this. So I think that's the main reason why you've seen uh, quadrupeds deployed there. But don't lose sight of the fact that even for wheeled platforms, there is not very much inspection that's going on. Uh, for wheel delivery, there's not very much going on. I mean. Uh, so uh, the penetration of these kind of service robotics is not as so deep. I mean, we've kind of to wear, as academics, we have to kind of wear both hats. But really, it's it's difficult for companies to be able to. Or when, I, when I say wear both hats, we have to allude to commercialization possibilities. But it's really difficult for companies to carve out non non academic customer niches. Yeah. All right, all right, okay. I think with uh, with that question, we finished all the um, all the questions from the chat. Uh, so I would like to conclude here and thank you uh, both uh, you, Morris and Avik for uh, for these two amazing talks uh, that will be uploaded later on, uh, on YouTube. Um, and uh, thanks again, everybody that uh, participated uh, uh, in, the, in this uh, workshop today. Thank you very much. I will stop recording now. <laughs>